Well, I heard, uh, heard a grumbling stomach next to me during, uh, during one of the speeches today, so it, it might have been my father, so I'll try to keep this short. <laughs> you know, anyone who reads the, the works of Dr. Luton, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. will find again and again a particular quote. It comes up quite often. It's this. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Uh, the, these words actually come from a poem of John Donne, which, as I say, Dr. King was fond of quoting. No person is an island, Dr. King wrote, and certainly he himself was no exception. In addition to all of the influences that uh, Regent Gary has spoke of, many of us don't think of all the international influences he had along the way. Uh, actually, in 1958, which was a few years before his, his March on Washington, his I Have a Dream speech, uh, Dr. King traveled to Africa. He went to Ghana because he wanted to see firsthand uh, this former UK colony gaining its independence. The following year, he went to India um, to see firsthand Gandhi's uh, theory of nonviolent resistance. Um, you may recall that some of his most famous speeches were actually delivered um, in Berlin and in, in Oslo, so, so to speak, overseas. And even his, his name itself um, shows his international influences. Uh, namely, he was actually, uh, as a child, it was Michael King, Jr., but his father, Michael King, Sr., on going to Germany and influenced by uh, the German theologian, Martin Luther, named himself uh, Martin Luther Sr., and then it is his child, Martin Luther King Jr. So really, from, as from childhood to adulthood, Dr. King was deeply moved by his international experiences. He described himself as, quote, a citizen of the world. And he repeatedly, repeatedly referred to conditions that he had seen when he was abroad. So I quote, almost two-thirds of the peoples of the world go to bed hungry at night. They are undernourished ill-housed, shabbily clad. Millions of them are in Asia, millions in Africa, and millions in South America." End quote. Millions and millions. But you, really, you only have to see one to really change your perspective. You can think of the child who, who dies because there was simply no clean water, the young woman who died in labor because there was absolutely no medical personnel there when she was giving birth, or the old man who died because the medications were simply too expensive. I think of uh, one of my experiences in Peru, uh, when we had a patient, we called him Don Mateo, which is, you know, traditionally uh, an older person, you give them the, the title Don. But he was actually only one year older than me. But we, we, we gave him this sort of title of respect because he was the gentlest, the kindest man, you know, that many of us had, had seen among the patients. And yet I watched him as he essentially slowly died of a disease that would have been treatable uh, here in the United States. Instead, I, I, was, I would wash out some of his uh, ulcers around his eyes with camel tea, because that's really the only thing that we had at that point. Don Mateo, like the thousands who die every day of these sorts of diseases, he did only one thing wrong. He was born in a developing country, and the relief didn't come in time. So for me, the draw to international health really has been as logical as algebra, which is something I dreaded as a child. I joined medical school, like I think most of us do, because I wanted to help others, to alleviate suffering. And then I came to think, well, what better way to do it? Where is there more need than in the international sphere? And we need sustainability, so why not just go there permanently? So that's my dream. That's my dream to, um, to go and live internationally, probably in South America. But even if I didn't feel this particular call to live abroad, I would have to admit that today's greatest challenges, today's greatest problems are, are really global problems, aren't they? If you think of, of climate change, of the economic crisis, of the flu pandemic, the human rights abuses that we see, poverty and hunger, these are global challenges and they, they demand global solutions. No person is an island, every person is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Dr. King believed deeply in the interconnectedness of humanity. You can find again and again a particular phrase where he talks about universal brotherhood. And in some of those same speeches of which he talks of universal brotherhood, he makes a particular observation, which I think is uh, very telling and very insightful for 21st century medicine today. And so I will quote, we know more about mathematics, about science, about social science than we have ever known in any period of the world's history. But something basic is missing. We've ended up with guided missiles, but misguided men. There's a sort of poverty of the spirit which stands in glaring contrast to our scientific and technological abundance. 
The richer we have become materially, the poorer we have become morally and spiritually. We have learned to fly the air like birds and swim the sea like fish. We have not learned the simple art of living together as brothers. Dr. King goes on to refer to the importance of faith. This came both in his sermons and his speeches, and we must recall that he was a Christian minister from the beginning to the end. And like many of us, he drew his motivation from his faith. He saw God in, in the least of his brethren. But my point here isn't to preach. Rather, I find in these words, in this quote, practical advice for all of us aspiring physicians. We spend so much of our time absorbed in the science textbooks, cells, proteins, molecules. We oftentimes forget about the human person for whom all of this is directed. When we see a suffering patient in front of us, we are tempted to treat them as a statistic or some sort of intricate composite of pathophysiological processes. But as our most recent Ethics Grand Round speaker spoke just this past Tuesday, this approach is incomplete at best. I believe if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were here today, if he was not martyred for his cause, I think he would repeat these very words. Show love to your patient as your brother or your sister, not in spite of their poverty, but because of it. All of us here in international health believe there's no better way to foster this compassion than spending time with the poorest of the poor in developing countries. Remember that Dr. King himself had to go to India before he could go to Washington. Oftentimes, we learn more about our local community by going outside of it. Thus, I would contend that if we want to train physicians who will treat their patients with compassion, if we want to train students who are willing to become primary care physicians for the poor, and we want to train doctors willing to stay in Texas and work in those rural communities, we should encourage them to go abroad during medical school, during their career here. You can see in studies, it works. And I'm very grateful for the steps that UT Southwestern has made in this direction. Great steps in just the recent past couple of years, and I wish only to encourage this resolve. Before I conclude, I should recognize that most of you here don't feel this call to international service. Instead, and equally, uh, equally importantly, you have made impressive sacrifices for the poor and forgotten of your own communities, particularly here in Dallas. You have worked to combat the injustices and poverty in our own city and state. That too we celebrate today, particularly the efforts of Tracy, Rochelle, Jimmy, and Regent Gary. Indeed, I am reminded that Dr. King, despite traveling extensively abroad, did his most important work locally and nationally. Yes, he went to Africa and Asia, but he came back and did his most important work in Montgomery, Birmingham, Memphis, Washington, D.C. Remember that all poverty and injustice is linked. These words, no person is an island, and one is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. As a final note, and as sort of a practical call with the immediacy which, which Dr. King was so fond of, of imparting his listeners, I'd like to make a particular challenge to all of us here today. I'm sure everyone has heard that just a couple of days ago there was an awful earthquake uh, in Haiti, and the Red Cross is estimating that perhaps 3 million people are currently suffering, and 50,000 will or have already died. So I'd like to encourage you in the spirit of Dr. King, uh, when you go home this evening, that go onto the internet, go to one of these many websites of the many charitable organizations that are trying to make some sense, some respite in, this, in these hellish conditions, and just make a donation. Um, I'm sure it's uh, much less than the sacrifice that many of those over there are making every day. I ask you to consider, in conclusion, these words from Dr. King. Here's a call for worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, or nation. It is a call for an all-embracing and unconditional love for all men. I encourage you all to respond to this call and to live the dream of Dr. King. Thank you and God bless.